Welcome, 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 one and all, to Griffin and David present Attack of the Podcast. Hi, Griffin. Hi, David. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? Well, I was on vacation last week, and I screwed up our recording schedule, and we missed a week, and I feel bad about it. It actually it worked out great because I needed that extra day to do more community service to offset the negative uh, energy I put into the world with our last episode. Uh, I've our been last episode. Donating all my time and money. You, our last episode was really embarrassing. But it was actually really fun to listen back to. Uh, JD. Uh, J, J, we are our guest is here. Our guest, the we'll great, introduce him later. Yeah, multi-hyphenate JD Amato. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. haven't introduced him yet. We haven't introduced him. But so, explain to JD. Um, y- you know in the in the Jenx how it doesn't make... Have you seen the Jenx? I've seen the Jenx, yeah. So you know how it makes no sense that he stole that sandwich? And you're like, this guy's on the run. Everyone's looking for him. Yeah. He He's has $35,000 in a bag or whatever. Yeah, in yeah. his car. He doesn't need it. Why did he steal this sandwich? And it's like some part of him was like it was a cry for help. Like he wanted to be caught. Right. I don't want to talk about this fucking movie anymore. I am so tired of this fucking movie. And I spent the last two weeks analyzing why in our last episode I read large sections, too many sections. Ben had to cut some out of a history paper I wrote in 10th grade called Back in Blackface, or Can You Minstrel Show Me How to Get to Racism Street? Which was me trying to tackle the entire issue of representation of African Americans in the media uh, in, in only the most inappropriate way possible. And in, in only the way that a young white male could. Yep. Um, the weirdest thing is that uh, Griffin is still not. talking about this when Be- he really should let it I'm just... I'm explaining to J.D., no, but yeah, okay. I, w- I, I don't want to talk about this movie anymore. I was trying to, you know, we're, we're happy to have you here. We're happy to talk about it. For once, I will say, I mean, this will tie into everything we're talking about today. I, I do find myself relating to Georgie Porgy Lucas more in the wake of that paper. Oh, I see. Because it's the same thing where I thought I was really doing good and taking a good stand. And this week, we're talking about Attack of the Clones, the second Phantom Menace movie from yeah. a filmmaking standpoint. Sure. J.D. Motto, who we haven't introduced yet. No, we haven't introduced him. Is It'd be a- like... 20 minutes from now. 20 minutes from now. Yeah. Sure. Is among many things, one, one of the finest young filmmakers of his generation. Thank you. Well, I, I know I have not been introduced yet, but no. I will say this is, not, this is not my thank you to you guys. I'll do that once you introduce me, but sure. thank you for having me on the podcast. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to talk about this movie. Of yeah. course. Um, one of the strangest sequels in film history. No question. No question. <laughs> you, get, you get a shot. You make a first movie. It does really well, but everyone hates it. Yeah. And somehow you pull it out of the hat. You get a second one. Right. And this is what he does with it. But this is the point. I, we, we and watch, there's a lot of criticism out there of this movie. Oh, a lot. A in, lot of criticism. In some way, even more than, than with The Phantom uh, Menace, the original Phantom Menace I, would say, I think Phantom Menace got more criticism for its characters or specific wrongs, such as Jar Jar or whatever, whereas this movie right, was the back more criticized yeah. as a film. Yes, I agree like, with that. No yeah. one really liked it as a piece of cinema yeah. at all. But we watched uh, in preparation... Uh, for this week, uh, we collectively watch a bunch of different documentaries and like featurettes and yeah, behind the scenes, which things. we probably should have watched to begin with, honestly, because it yeah. really colored in a lot of the things we've sort of been speculating on for weeks now. Well, here's a, a quick side rant. Uh, go, go ahead. This, oh, about the Blu-ray. This extras? fucking Blu-ray is infuriating. I don't know. I don't even know what to say. I used to have this on DVD. This movie, and then DVD, it was like play movie commentaries. Extras and the extras and it, it you like got your deleted nice scenes, you got your featurettes, you got your trailers titles. and your interviews. So wait, what's the Blu-ray that you guys have? It's okay. this. It's the the complete saga on Blu-ray. So it's the, the two so it's Star got Wars episodes movies. one and two, and then it's got like seven. It's bonus got other discs, discs, so many discs. So you many haven't many looked discs. into any of those discs. <laughs> no, 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 not There's at all. There's the one, the one <laughs> disc I looked at that had the special features for Attack of the Clones. Yeah, that's the only thing relevant right now. But it's like literally. Two movies, seven discs of special features. And on the disc, yeah, yeah, it's all these. And there's all these, like, paintings of, like, the later, you know, these expanded universe characters. These fucking, like, trading card characters yeah, that none of us give strange. a shit about. And, but, so the, on the Blu-ray, the, the George special created a lot features, of fake characters just for merchandise that aren't, yeah, don't yeah. appear in either of the movies. It's very strange. Han Solo, all these dumb fucking, <laughs> anyway. So on this, on this, the, the special features are laid out by Planet? Yes. And uh, but they don't make any sense. No, it's like kind of basically just each planet, and there's four. Gets like a you know five minute movie about like how they designed it, and that's kind of it. Can I, I read aloud what the planets are? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you could uh, uh, you know intense listeners could probably guess. Okay, so Nabu, 
Nabu. Yep. Nabu. I think Naboo. you're looking at episode one right now. Or no, or no, you're looking at episode two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Naboo is one of the planets. Okay, yeah. 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 Uh, Queen Amidala is from Nabu. Yes. Aware. Fun fact. Aware. Ta- Tatooine. Yep, Tatooine. Yeah, you think I don't know she's planet. from Naboo? We've been doing this for joking. fucking- It was a hilarious joke. It's like 70 Scott. hours of my life. Cor- Coruscant. Yeah. Coruscant. Yep. I always said Coruscant. Coruscant. I don't know. Um, then Coruscant again, then Nabu again, then Tatooine again, then- Geonosis. 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 There you go. Mighty Geonosis. And then it just goes on and on and yeah, on. Yeah, there's more yeah. written. There's just a lot of stuff. But see, it's probably like thanks and liner notes. I don't know. There's a lot there's of a lot like of weird paintings. Yeah, weird there's like paintings. a lot of material that I mean, I appreciated about how they designed Dexter Jetster. Oh, really? I think I missed the. Oh no, no, I didn't. A lot of material about the diner itself too. Yes, the design of the diner. But there are like a lot of like like fucking like Blu-ray like 360 degree virtual reality turnarounds of maquettes they made of the creatures. But they cut out all these fucking documentaries that were on the original DVD that actually showcase the filmmaking process in depth. But I think it may be because they sort of highlight the embarrassing problems of the movie. They're all very sad to watch. They are sad to watch. They're like capturing the Freedmen. It's like people fighting against <laughs> yeah. no, but this an is inevitability. Thing, but I mean, as I, I'm pretty sure yeah. that these things are always made before the movie even comes out, right? Yes. The DVD is kind of set up before the movie's premiere, right? Like even commentaries, mm-hmm. everything. Like everyone's recording this without knowing how it was received. Yeah. Right. So you're seeing all these guys who must have slaved away. I mean, George Lucas at one point says they were working like 22 hours a day and not eating yeah. and like sleeping in their like chairs. Well, basically. we'll get to that sequence in a second because this oh is the biggest God. breakthrough of the, all the behind the scenes material. And like me. they must be thinking like we have produced like a genre stopping like piece of like advanced work here. Yeah. Like, our technology that we've invested in this is so incredible. Yeah. Have you ever seen the movie Cube? Yes. I've, I've seen the movie Cube. So the movie Cube is a bunch of people are, wake up in a cube and they don't know why, how they all got there, and then they start to learn that each of them had a part in building this thing that they're all stuck inside. And, like, this guy's like, I don't know. I I was just told, I was part of a contracting company, and we were just told to make these, you know. Right, they weren't aware that they were making the yeah, cube prison. half mile long. That's, in watching the behind the scenes, that's sort of what it felt like, is that every person was just sort of <laughs> like, I just made these walls, and I made the best walls I could. <laughs> yeah. And none of them had any idea what the bigger picture was. It's so yeah, it's and like I think the parable people, of the elephant, right? The uh, you know right. someone describes a Ten tail and feel, uh, yeah. right, right, and uh, someone describes a trunk and like they yeah they right. can't put it all together to be one thing. Well, what was interesting to me is that every person they interview seems to have like a lot of enthusiasm for what they're doing, like a certain like confused wariness about it, but like real enthusiasm for like you know it's a crazy project, this and this and that. And then anytime they cut to George, whether it's like a talking head interview or like. Sort of like studio footage film. of yeah. him looking over things, giving notes or whatever. It always feels, and I watched a bunch of. Uh, what is JD pulling out? He's he's got the movie. He's got on the movie. Oh, he's going to address certain points. No, um, I'm just like, going to have it play in the background. Yeah, good. that's cool. Um, he, uh, I, I watched some featurettes for Phantom Menace too, mm-hmm. and between all the behind the scenes stuff for both of them, he always just feels like he just wants to get it over with. He, he George does, does? weirdly you it feels like he's so? ripping off he, a band aid. He does feel a little weary. I mean, it's something about he has that monotone like way of talking too. That doesn't help. Phantom Menace. I think he was genuinely excited, and I think starting up Attack of the Clones when everyone had hated Phantom Menace or was predominantly hated. Sure, he was just kind of like oh, fuck, he had to put his this. blinders on a lot more. Yeah. Honestly, what I believe is that he he is the only one that can see the full elephant. Right. Right. Sure. That, supposedly. And I think he's having trouble in these behind the scenes seeing how it all comes together mm-hmm. when he is literally the only person that is in that position. Yes. And it seems like he might just be sort of stressed out and hoping that all these pieces independently will come together. So it feels like a lot of the choices he's making, again, this is me completely just yeah. endowing characteristics onto him based on what I saw. in the. But like, it's literally just him watching these small things and making commentary on them in the, the, the in micro the, perspective. The micro. Yeah. yeah. Where he's going, uh, maybe that hair should be longer, or this or that. And you can tell there's a hesitancy for him to connect the larger dots of like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. This doesn't seem to this be connected. This movie's exactly. logic, like it's, yeah, it's general logical framework is is completely unsound. It's like the ultimate forest through the trees movie where it's like right. every leaf is like lovingly designed. Sure. And watching sort these of. things. We have, we're going to talk about that. They're not all beautifully designed. No, right, right. There you go. they're yes, lovingly there's designed. A, so much effort is being and, put and into And watching it. what does remain on the fucking Blu-ray special features, all these things about like Zam Wessel's tunic or like Dexter Jetster or how mm-hmm. they designed like. 
the the uh, uh, Tuscan Raider babies who are on screen for half a second right. and like all the thought they put into it. I mean, I didn't realize this, but they explained that the fucking Tuscan Raiders teepees are all made out of like skin and bones from larger like woolly mammoth type creatures. And that's on screen in the dark so briefly that barely registers. Yeah. And the guy talked about like, okay, so most we thought they need a home. They're nomadic cultures. They need to move around. So what's something that offers them shelter but doesn't this and that? And then where would they get the TP from? Okay, so what if the structure of the TP instead of the sticks with the bones? It's like this guy's putting so much thought into it. It's on screen for half a second. Yeah. And it doesn't even register because you're so confused by what's happening in the story at I know. all times. It's the saddest part. Like the environments don't really matter. And there are like, some, even though like, they're very well crafted. There's some really good design work at like yeah. moments, and it's all this fucking like white noise because you're just you're sh- like shoving needles into your eyes and trying to make sense of this fucking thing. JD, yes, you had never seen the movie before. I have never seen this movie before. You watched it today. You I had watched... seen Phantom Menace once as a child. I had that seen was your Phantom memory. Menace once. I think when I, it saw, came I out. think I saw Phantom Menace a couple times. Oh sure, mm-hmm. sure. Um, really. It didn't do it for yeah, me. Yeah, you were bummed yeah. out by it. I was bummed out by it. I, I at the time, thought it was the best one yet. And I by best one yet, I mean, of course, the best movie ever made. Right. That's yeah. what he means. And I don't know why, what they were based on, but I, ha- I, I felt like I went into it having expectations that this was going to be a great movie. Right. Uh-huh. And it did not fulfill the expectations that I had set up. Yeah. Um, you know, apropos of nothing. Uh-huh. Uh, but because of that, I was too saddened to watch this next one mm-hmm. um, to the point that uh, I wanted to live instead in a world where I hadn't seen it because <laughs> so you're saying we have shattered your world we shattered well by making you appear on this podcast. like 15 years to yeah go. you had a yeah. while I wanted to live in a world where I hadn't seen it because that way it could have been good that I could you know I wanted it to be the a mystery box that yeah. I could always go I haven't seen it so it could actually be right, good right yeah. Schrodinger's cat sort of thing yeah. exactly um it, yeah exactly I, it, until observed I had no idea if if it would ignite a nuclear explosion that would destroy me or keep us all safe I have a similar thing. I'm like a pop culture completist where like even if I dislike something, if I like a part of it, I want to have the full breadth of knowledge. Yeah. But RoboCop, which is one of my five favorite movies of all time, I have movie. purposely Fucking avoided people. everything else related to Me RoboCop. Me knew. I've never seen the sequels. I never, didn't see the remake. Even though the re- I saw the remake, which is stupid on Pe- my part. Some people were like, hey, the remake's not bad. No, but I, f- yeah, I mean, I just had no interest. But RoboCop 1 has such a beautiful ending. Yeah. It's the most perfectly There's ended film. There's no reason film. to make a sequel to this Right, movie. that I just don't want to see the second movie where at the start he's got the helmet back on again. He's talking like RoboCop and he's lost like his humanity yeah, and he has no to go sense. through the same fucking and what, But you did watch every episode of the TV show and wrote and directed every single episode and played every part, right? I didn't watch them. I did write, direct, and play. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, actually, I think I've seen a couple episodes. Uh, of the but TV I don't like show. to watch my own work. No, no. Um, okay, so now your world is shattered and you now live in a world where this exists. This we're, is... we're about seven minutes before we introduce you, by the way. I'm keeping yeah. an eye on the clock. Copy that. Yeah. The box is open. Yeah. So you've seen Attack of the Clones. I've seen it. You had 15 years to theorize what a sequel to The Phantom Menace would entail. And we right. have been trying to ask, like, is this a good sequel to The Phantom Menace? We're it's not been even one of our argue, core questions. Is it a good movie? That's right. not is even it a question. Good, how is it a good, does it work sequel? as a sequel? I just watched it. Yeah. And I don't understand what happened in it. <laughs> yeah, it makes no sense. Oh, that happens. Um, During the movie, that's a problem. I don't understand what's happening. We're in week eight, and we still don't understand what's happening not in really. half the movie. But yeah. not in a way – well, here's the thing is that there's films where I don't know what's happening where it feels like um, – You're, you're wait, not supposed let, to know. Let me, let, me, let me back up to this and say this, that this film is an achievement in several ways. This is an impressive wow. film. Okay. Okay. Special effects-wise, where they're at, they did some things that were extremely ambitious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for – what they had at their fingertips, what they created, is an amazing feat of filmmaking. But to me, and that is not to say this is an objective truth, it didn't it didn't satisfy what I wanted from it. Mm-hmm. And what I will say is that I didn't quite understand what was going on, not because things were purposely being kept from me in a way that um, was uh, made me imagine or and then get frustrated by it. It was. I was so inundated with information about what was going on that I couldn't keep track of it. And it became just this complete sort of like a mess of trade federation understandings and who's this person, why is this happening? And I think it also didn't help because a lot of the technological, um, a lot of the things that made the film so hard to create technologically also made the film hard for the performers in it. Mm-hmm. And I think 
as a viewer, you rely on the performers to sure, let you too. know how you should be feeling. And when the performers don't know how they should be feeling, then as an audience, you don't know how you should be feeling. And then you've lost all guideposts for what's going on. So when a piece of information is said and no one really reacts to it, <laughs> nor do I, and then it doesn't register true. as important. Yes. Yes. You, I think that's an incredible point. You're making a, a, a case for it as like an aggressively surreal film. Though. You're making a case for it as a film that like abandons any... Uh, like pretend, you know, any yeah. like of the uh, established ways of having an audience enjoy a movie. Aud- audience empathy is like, yes, yeah. right, right. Yeah, and I don't you're th- very right that yes, like important things are said and characters re- react with blank faces. Well, I think th- all what it the speaks time. to, yeah. I, I think all these actors are trying to like make declarations of love, <laughs> things like that. I think all these <laughs> actors are trying to make deliberate, specific acting choices at every moment. I don't think anyone's asleep at the wheel. I think they're just genuinely so confused about what's going on around them and what they're supposed to be playing that the confusion reads more than their acting choices. This is the weirdest scene. Yeah, we, uh, the this movie. Is the testicle I've been sort of cycling around, and it's the, it's the testicle creatures, exactly. There's a fucking thing on the Blu-ray where the guy talks about designing the testicle creatures and how he had the design, and then he couldn't figure out the anatomy of how the musculature would work, and he worked on it for months. Why would he do that? Because why didn't George Lucas say, you know what, these actually look really weird. Let's do something else. Because he had thousands of people working on the movie, and he went, "Your job's just to design a testicle." So yeah, but we should talk about it. And JD is right; like this movie is doing a lot of things that movies hadn't done before. It was a filmmaking revolution, a lot of ways. It was, and they're trying to do something that, to this day, would be difficult to achieve if they tried to make a film this ambitious from a um, CGI standpoint. Right. It would be difficult. And they were do they the inception of this film was probably twenty years ago now was when they started planning to make this film. In the amount that technology has changed in um, computer graphics and three D rendering and stuff like that has been leaps and bounds over the past five years. It's let alone let alone where it was twenty years ago when they started sort of coming up with the plan for how they're going to do this. So the fact that they achieved some things they achieved is really impressive. But that's it. Does not stand the st- test of time. No. And also, I don't think stood the test of time at the at the moment because they were they were doing things that they wanted to do things that they did not have the technology to achieve yet, and they did the best they could possibly do under the circumstances. And it was really impressive because these were the best of the best of the best working on it. Mm-hmm. But they just did not have the tools they needed to achieve the things that they were trying to do. I also think. I mean, there there are a lot of aspects to this. I think there is a very very wide gulf between the best effects in the movie and the worst effects in the movie. What do you think the best effects in the movie are? Well, okay, let's just talk about, like, character animation, right? Because we have a ton of digital characters in this movie. Sure. Outside of a fully animated movie, sure. this probably had the largest number of CGI creatures in any film up until that point. This was the first ever film to have a digital supporting cast. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, there are, like, ten live-action actors in this movie. Yeah, and this was really the first time that main characters were digital. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and in Phantom Menace you with, have... Uh, with Phantom Menace. I mean, I'm, yeah. Phantom Menace and this, but this was the first film series where that was... But Phantom Menace has like three, you know? Well, it has right. all the Gungans. Yeah, but okay, or so... Or Gungans. In, in terms of actual, like, characters with, like... Thank me- you for correcting yourself. <laughs> it's it's like Watto, Tarple, yeah. Boss Nass, and Jar Jar, and then the battle droids. And the battle droids don't have to really perform. Uh, yeah, I feel like... The Gungan saying... army, you're seeing, like, big mass things. But in terms of, like, characters who have, like, more than a scene... No, no I know you're ...an actual, like, emotional way... Well, way-ish. also the pod racers. But I guess that's, you know, that's sort of... Yeah. It's, it's yeah, Saboba, I guess you could Saboba. say Saboba. Saboba has a comeback in this film that in- I'm not a fan of. You're talking about Saboba or Watto? Watto's our favorite flying Wado. space juice. Saboba is the pod racer who he... Right, Saboba. Wait, where's Saboba? Is he in this movie? Saboba's in this movie. You Wait, guys what don't notice Saboba? Where's Saboba in this movie? You guys don't JD know where Sebulba has like is? a devilish grin on where's his face Sebulba? right now. Sebulba was one of the first moments in watching this where I became disappointed in the movie. What, 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 we've been no, I, come, this on, come on, come on, come on. I want to know. I want to know. Come on. Okay. Like, I could try to find no, the No, but moment. just say it first. Okay. I'll, I'll so, try and find it as you talk about okay, it. Okay. So when the assassin tries to uh, shoot worms at Queen Amidala, Sam Wessel, a changeling. Yeah. Senator Amidala, whatever the, her name She's is. She's a senator now. That's true. Yeah. Scrolling to that scene. Obi-Wan, for a reason that is beyond me, decides to jump out of the window and grab onto this robot. As one does. Yep. And then Anakin decides to get into a... Speeder. Speeder. Uh, convertible speeder. Yeah. And drive after A hot rod. As one does. As one does. During this, they cut through traffic and cause all sorts of problems. And at one point, 
um, it cuts to a reaction shot of a driver who they've just cut off, who is Saboba. And as a callback to the pod racing scene, I believe his line is Jedi, Jedi Pudu. I'm trying to find it exactly. How do we fucking miss this? But like, re- all right, anyway. This is unbelievable. I now know what moment you're talking about. I never I know, fucking I know what you're talking that. about too. I'm yeah. trying to, here's like, that's not Sebulba, but there's a guy. It is sort of like, yeah. I'm pretty sure. It's a certain. jokey callback to. I'm I'm 100% sure. No, that's I'm sure Sebulba, you're right. Because that's Sebulba's line. It's yeah, calling people poodoo. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. But he looks old. Yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, well Anakin He's looks with a another older. guy. Let me see. It's probably one of those slaves he owns. <laughs> we did backstory. We, we did a backstory episode for all the pod racers because they all have incredibly Jeez. dense and complicated backstories on yeah, like like Wikipedia. Uh, Ben Quadro and yeah, by Ben Quadraneros and oh, oh, Doug Dud- Bolt and almost all of them are slave owners. So Bulba tried to no, it was someone else. Sebulba Sebulba is like yeah, a, is a pimp. Yeah, Jesus Christ, that is definitely Sebulba. You're totally right. And that, that other He's guy got... next to him is another pod racer. I forget what his right. name is, but that's a different pod racer. Jesus Christ. Um, How did we even get on this? The way second. Sebulba owns a bunch of sex slaves. He owns like four women, and then one of his competitors hired an assassin to kill Sebulba's sister and mother. Like that's how gross the world of pod racing is. It's gross, JD. Yeah, I, that moment really upset me though. Well, yeah, well, wait, sucks. how how did I'm trying to track back? What, how did why why did you why were you mentioning Sebulba? Uh, digital characters. Oh, digital characters. Well, okay. right. This oh, yeah. is a film that had a lot of digital characters. We've got. I, well, let's I was, talk about some of them. I was uh, gonna, Yoda. So, yes. Uh, 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 the 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 the, the Lama Sioux and the other one, you the, know, the, the Kamonians. The, this will literally take the entire podcast. Yeah, yeah, we can't do this. I'm just trying to. Uh, all of the long neck people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of the, um, at certain points, uh, Obi Wan is digital. Well, this is that's the points. other Jar Jar Binks, I mean, Dexter R- Jets. R two and C three PO seem to be like largely digital, especially yeah. after you see that documentary where yeah. like they seem to be just animatics. I yeah. don't believe there's a single character in this film. That at some point isn't mostly digital. Right. Yeah, every character, yeah, anyone who's on screen for more than two seconds. I mean, Danny Fatoni. Do you know there's one? There's there. only one scene in this film that did not have. Oh, wait. Was it this film? I believe it's this film that did not have CG in it. What's the scene? It has to be one of the Anakin Padme scenes, right? No, I, I might be wrong. Never mind. <laughs> It's it does tough. seem, honestly, that seems impossible. I can't think of a scene where that would be true. Everything is like has even when CGI they're having dinner. There's the floating pair. Yeah, no, there's all, no, but no. Forget that. Just the backgrounds, the sets, yeah. everything is filled out in CG. As we see in these documentaries, it's all blue screens with one set, like one like piece of set. The, well, let, yeah. let me let me say this thing. It, it, this uh, this point I was gonna make the the goal between like I think the Comonians look really good. I keep on they getting look their okay. fucking. Okay, you go on about how great they I think look. They look fine. I think the, the set looks bad. I, I think. think the texture. I agree with you, but this is my point. And then someone like Dexter Jets, or you know, I love him. I think looks like a PlayStation One cut. He does. He does. Dexter he, Jetster he looks does not really blend Dexter in with Dexter the, the diner, the diner owner. owner. Yeah. I like the design of him a lot, but the animation itself is just ben like, like that. Ben like it looks, the, uh, it looks like a fucking PlayStation One game. Yeah, no, he. I mean, well, you haven't played a PlayStation One game in a while. Those things are oh, real bad. I played a PlayStation One game in a while. <laughs> Which one? Uh, Bug Slash. <laughs> I found it at a Goodwill. It's really bad. You know, like how like that era of video games, like not the early era where they knew exactly what they were doing, but the space in between when it got advanced enough to get ambitious, and when they had the ambitions but not the technical ability to execute it. Sure. Those games are so tough to play because they're so bad that they're almost they're unwinnable. illogical, yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like playing in a world where like the rules of the world don't make sense. Right. And if you take the wrong step, then you like fall through the floor. And then you're right. just like walking through the floor with your arms up like this and you can't get out. That's, I mean, one of my favorite video games ever is this video game Deus Ex, which like is trying to do a lot of things that games do now where it's like you have to be stealthy and like mm-hmm. if you leave a body somewhere and other people find it, they're going to make a fuss about you. But know. then there's like a glitch where if you well, like... It, you can still tap like, at the wrong time. The body starts levitating. Well, well, there's that, but like it's a, it's still limited. So you can also just walk up to anyone, hit them with a crowbar, <laughs> and then like shock them, and then they're kind of done, and they won't make a fuss because no one else is nearby. Like it's yeah. still too easy to game the system. It's still yeah. a computerized. Like you can you know where the where the walls are basically. I don't know what I'm talking about. My point is th- there are not enough people in the world with the skill to be able to execute every single different digital thing this film asked for. Oh, I see. There's sure. so much, like, from the environments to the props to the ships to the characters to modifications to the live-action actors. Um, it, 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 as you said, it's still too ambitious to pull off. What this was to me was, like, when people tried to build, like, spaceships 
before we really understood how to build spaceships. Yeah. Like this, this to me was the like, I mean, like this was like the Apollo one. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. uh, we're going to use tape and Scott, like we're going to try to make this work and it's not quite going to work. And we're going to learn a lot of lessons from this. Like they this. set out. Look how bad this scene it's looks. Oh, you but mean this, this, they this scene where they didn't have time to do everything. The scene where they sit in ramen spoons. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. was like a good time to, of course, say our, our guest today. Is that not what they're? Yeah, they're sitting in ramen spoons. Our guest today is J.D. Amato. Oh, yeah, we went 25 minutes in. Yeah. Shit. Yeah, this is J.D. Amato. He's director of the Chris Gethard show. Showrunner as well, Showrunner. Right? Yep. Uh, uh, filmmaker, what, improviser, on and off sometimes. A, Still, a brilliant, right? yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, multi-talented, brilliant One, one of our finest minds. Oh, he's, so, he's so great. Guys, thank you. I'm oh. so happy to be here. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so happy to talk yeah, about uh, these obscure films. Host of 12-Hour Day. Ah, uh, yes, 12-Hour Day podcast. podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of some of the other things. Uh, you, you made... Terry Weathers Mystery, you're one of the creators. Yes, creators. Yep. The Terry oh, Weathers Mystery running at you, you did Cop Show. Cop Show, Colin Quinn. me and Colin Quinn. Yep. Stay tuned for more. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. That's Perhaps. I mean... Maybe. Who knows? Who knows? Colin's oh. been teasing it on Twitter. I feel like this is oh, really? the comfortable level of announcement of like, okay. who knows, maybe. Uh, wink, wink. With a co-star in Griffin Newman. Hey. Yeah, Griffin hey Newman's now. on those. Hey, now. Breakaway hey. star of the series. He's really funny. I'm supposed to only work one day. Yeah. On the first one, yeah. Yeah, and then you were just too good. Hey, come on. Get out. You're too funny. You're trying to, you're trying to gra-gra me? Come on. Um, Do you know about Gragra? No. She's our yeah, third we, favorite like, character. We gotta okay. do that off mic. We gotta, We've done we, enough yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this film, yes, and a lot of special features we watched uh, attest to this. Was sort of the first thing that could fall into the category of uh, they keep on calling it virtual filmmaking. Yes, yeah, where like the camera shakes, but there's no camera, and yeah. it's it's all effects. It's all just to kind of look like a, a film. And it's it's usually, but it's a cartoon. I mean, a it was the first mainstream film shot on digital video. Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, and when they refer Entirely. to virtual filmmaking, what that basically means is that instead of shooting scenes, you're shooting elements. And then you're using those elements to produce shots in digital reality. Shots. Right, shots. So, so that's why yeah. that's why a lot of the live action elements of this were shot independent of anything else, only as almost like a necessity to capture them. And then they were composed and actually framed and put into reality in the computer. But everything was like pre visualized before the actors were even brought on set. And then so the actors could be shown these weird, like kind of globby like 3D models of what they were supposed to be seeing, like right. what would right. eventually be around. Your them. decisions are being made for you, which is always great as an actor. Yeah, right. And then, and then beyond that, something like the Battle of Genosis is like when you watch the behind the scenes stuff. Seems like the most glaring example of this was like every different performer in that was shot. Like there were never more than three actors on the soundstage at the same time. Right. And that's a scene with a ton of people. Right. And it was like, oh, here are three Jedi's. They're reacting to nothing. There's not even a stand-in yeah, pretending to be a battle around, droid. Right, yeah. They're waving it around. And then later, like six months later, he'd shoot Christopher Lee in a box. And then like two weeks before that, he'd shoot Anakin. And then like a week after that, he'd shoot Padme kissing Anakin. Like it's like all – any element within the shot was shot at a different time. Yeah. So for people that don't know the process of making films, especially like action-oriented stuff, right, is you have your script. And then from the script, you go into pre stage, which is basically – it can be anything from just compiling photographs that are sort of a lookbook of what you want down to actually mapping out the shots, animating them, creating animatics, which are sort of like um, almost think of them as like uh, uh, almost like a flip book of what's yeah, going on. Yeah, but I was thinking the same thing. A flip book, but instead of there being 300 <laughs> cells, it's like two. So like an animatic is usually very, very light. Um, but for this, because there were so many elements they needed to be on top of, um, it was just e- easier for their previs team to sort of self-shoot sort of versions of what they're going for to sort of prove how it would work. And so instead of having storyboards, they had these actual sort of cartoons, filmed lo-fi Weird, yeah. video of basically it would be the animators or their animators' family or their friends on these little sound stages they had in their offices shooting the scenes acting out the parts. They show footage. They're, like, wearing fucking Jedi robes. Right. And they're in one of George Lucas's cars or something. Right. Like, they're, they're playing the part. They, it, there's just a shittier version of Attack of the Clones that exists in full that they use to plan out how to make Attack of the Clones. And in this film, too, I know it was the case where George Lucas basically said, here's the script. You guys audition shots for me. Tell me what you want. Right. And people would go, basically, so in, in a film like this, there's going to be so many departments that are in charge of creating shots. 
that everyone probably gets a handful of shots, like three to five shots or se- or like one sequence or three to five different shots. And, they, and then George would go, all right, show me the best version of that. What should your sequence be? And so someone would go, well, we have the, we have the, the, like, you know, the speeder chase scene. So we thought it could be like this and like this and like this. And instead of drawing it during that, they would just sort of shoot it and sort of say, here's they what we want it to look like. Yeah, right. they'd make like... they make the movie. They'd make the garage version of the movie. Right. And then it became the case where George Lucas, instead of going, here's what the shots are, here's what I want, he would watch it and then go... Okay. Okay, or maybe we like, should cut to this here. This or, and this, and, you know, he'd sort of pick what he liked. Exactly. Yeah. It was sort of kid at a candy store as opposed to someone creating sort of a framework for and what the visual like a story is. Like and the movie. Thing, it was like everyone bringing their scenes to the, the table. And right. the thing we have to note is you're saying like the script existed, but as they say in these things, often the script is just like, then a, a battle occurs. Like it's right. very bare bones. Like the yeah. Clone Wars stuff basically it sounds like it was just a page of like, you know, there's some explosions. Ships and then it was in. like, you guys go and what can you come up with? And yeah. so they make up all kinds of crazy stuff. And my prediction is that the reason that became the process is because I think in probably the original conversations with ILM and the special effects team, the conversation was we need to be very involved in the story process because the decisions that are made there um, are going to inf- affect how we do things. And the things that we're are possible for us to do are going to affect what the story can be because we're at a stage of special effects and making that film where basically there were certain things that could be achieved and couldn't be achieved. And so I'm sure the conversation was – the story department and the visual effects department need to be one and the same because they need to be constantly talking. And so that's why I think the, the conversation became not, here's what I want you to do. It became, tell me how we can do this. And then it put the creative onus on the special effects team to be creating all these sequences and all this stuff. And it probably wasn't from a laziness, but it was probably just from sort of a fear of um, stepping into an arena that the special effects team couldn't come up with. So I think that put sort of a, undue focus on the special effects and pre-visualization department to basically create the film from scratch and then George Lucas to be the one sort of overseeing it all. And then and I think he splices his pro- actors into it, basically. Yeah, and then I think he probably had a hard time seeing the big picture of how it all connected because this was also very early in CGI, and so people weren't used to giving notes on uh, pre-renders and things like that mm-hmm. of stuff that looked really, really sparse. And so I think he just had to trust the process also. So I think a lot of this was sort of the process taking on a mind of its own and creating this film despite the creative will of anybody. It's basically well, like a, a film by committee, which is sort of tough. It like metastasized into its own creature and then no one could stop the movie. Like the movie well, became something bigger than any one person. I mean, I'll say like watching the special features, then when you see the movie, you're like, wow, they actually, like it's kind of incredible they made a movie at all. It yeah. looks like okay. It's an yeah. okay looking movie. Yeah. And because uh, when, yeah, it does not seem, everything you see does not seem remotely conducive to making any kind of film. No. no. And the special effects, you know, th- this film gets a lot of criticism for its special effects. Its special effects are beautifully done, but... Um, they don't really can, contribute to the story they don't or contribute. what you want to happen. And I mean, it gets into a bigger conversation of the point of filmmaking and visual storytelling and why you choose to do th- the things that you I, do. I want to get into that conversation. Right, and so I think, I think the special effects from a technical standpoint and achievement standpoint, are incredible. Mm-hmm. But I don't think they serve the Oscar story. Made. Yeah, I don't think they serve the story, nor do they serve the purpose of why they should have been included in the film. And I think because of that, um, it created a lot of issues. And then the the focus becomes on the specificity of the effects and the details of the effects, which at the time they're dealing with a lot of issues. Which can sort of, We can talk about the special effects and sort of from a more technical perspective why they why people have the issues they have and what the technical limitations are that sort of created those issues that people have because nowadays you look at the stuff and you go why is this so cartoony and so bad and how is it da-da? yeah but it was a lot of the technical limitations that they're dealing with is stuff that hadn't been invented yet or was right about to be invented that they didn't have they were all inven- of. well this movie lost to the two towers right for the oscar for visual effects that mm-hmm. year and the two towers has better visual effects than this movie. Less, but better. Less, but better. Quality over quantity. But I would say that even the movie before the two towers has worse visual effects, or like at least yes. has a lot of moments where you can see the seams a lot more. Like yeah. this was all being invented, like right. you know, and like the the New Zealand guys made their own stuff in their advances that all sort well, of now is becoming normal. Yeah. And, like, and also Peter Jackson very smartly, and this is what everyone sort of like 
complimented him on for the original Lord of the Rings films and and uh, criticized him for in the Hobbit films, of uh, avoiding stepping away from, is he was really smart in when to use practical and when to use digital. Sure. But it's like build practical stuff, extend it with digital, right. you know, modify it with digital. But The Two Towers does have... Gollum. It does have a digital character. Oh, but that's what that I'm saying. Works. It's like, like whereas these characters don't work. But, but if you go, bi- I'm going to build some sets. Yeah, no, that of course. saves the time that the effects people would have to spend building the sets to let more people work on Gollum, mm-hmm. make Gollum look as good as he can look, rather than like, oh fuck, we have to design the table too. Ugh, we need ten people on the table this week. Well, because George didn't want to film a table. Something to keep in mind is that this was before. Um, Performance capture Mm -hmm. or even motion capture was a ubiquitous process in cinema, I think. Mm. Oh, yeah, totally. Gollum was the first performance capture character. With, like, the dots on the face. Yeah, and performance capture is basically where you create motion tracking marks. I mean, you sort of step back and talk about the special effects stuff and how special effects work. But Gollum was one of the first motion capture and motion performance capture characters in the history of film. And so if you look at what happens in Star Wars, they were basically flying without a net. The animators had to just make everything up themselves. They didn't have yeah. a baseline to work yeah. with. A lot of times, there it wasn't that there was... Uh, a lot of times it was, you, you'll cover a character and sort of if you're shooting blue screen, you'll cover them in blue fabric and have them act stuff out. And they did that a little bit. But a lot of times, literally it was just an actor alone in a room. Responding to nothing. Talking yes. to nothing. And Liam which, Neeson talks about it in one of those documentaries where he's, he's like, I really focus. wanted to focus on something because I feel like audiences want you to be reacting to something well, but he had nothing to focus on. Yes. as difficult as that is for an actor, that is equally as difficult for an animator. Sure, of course. Because you are, given, <laughs> yeah, you so are given no context or reference. Yeah. And do, this, do you know who it's even worse for, J.D.? The audience. <laughs> <laughs> it was, Nobody wins. <laughs> no one wins. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of issues that um, we can sort of get into the details of, I think, a lot of the things that stick out to people. Speaking of that, though, briefly, there there was a moment that really jumped out to me. They don't even comment on it, but it's in the, there's like a blue screen acting feature at. Yeah. It's just at the process of it. And Ewan McGregor's like, look, I'm not going to say it was easy or that it was fun. Hopefully it worked. But he's clearly like, I don't know if this is a fucking performance. Right. And we've already talked about We think he does a pretty decent job. He, well, like, he improves with each yeah, Someone know. like Hayden Christensen, who seems lost at sea. Right. Well, you, I was, it, no wonder. I mean, I, yeah. he's not a great actor, but well, like, no wonder. I don't know. For, th- the fact that this performance is that bad, I attribute to him being that lost at Maybe, sea. Maybe, but I. Right. The point I was going to make, right, though, the thing that kind of blew my mind, and, and what you're talking about, like uh, them flying without a net and having to figure it out as they went along, they showed the behind the scenes of the Dexter Jetster diner scene. And they did. That was a physical set that was largely practical in camera. Sure. Obviously with like CGI elements in the background. But they built that whole fucking thing. And then they had an actor playing Dexter Jetser, the voice of Dexter Jetser, on set with Ewan McGregor. But there was the moment that's supposed to be the two of them hugging where they make physical contact. And he didn't do it because they didn't want to have to cover up sure. the CGI. And then they show. They don't comment on this, but they just show as part of the like reel of like progression. Um, them having to create a fully CGI Jedi robe. Like a fully CGI cloak, because his cloak didn't move the way it would if someone with four a huge bigger arms thing, yeah, was grabbing did. him. Right. So they right. like filmed a guy wearing a cloak, being hugged by the air, and then they were like, "Oh fuck!" Now we have to spend like a month where someone has to digitize a cloak and make it have the right amount of fibers, and then the <laughs> physics, and have the light go through it, and then have the cloak move the way it would with the four arms, and I keep on going back and forth with the guy animating Dexter Jetser to be like. Are the arms hairy? Because if they were hairy, then the cloak would move more. Yeah, yeah. And it's like they just fucking planned everything out in the worst way possible because no one had done it before and they were biting off way more than they could chew. But I also wanted to say, as I was saying to JD before podcast started, um, in those featurettes, you see footage of Hayden Christensen, like, you know, during shooting. Yeah. He seems really animated and yeah. fun. In the he's interviews, like he's laughing. like, it's a great fucking movie. I'm having a great time. He looks like there's these scenes of him joking around with yeah. Ewan McGregor and like, you know, and uh, where is that Where's on screen? Like, yeah. it's not there. Not he there. seems great. Yeah, he seems like a fun guy. You know, he's in this movie called 90 Minutes in Heaven now. No. It's coming out in a few weeks. It's like one of those Christian movies about a guy who like dies and goes to heaven and then he comes back to earth and he's like, I was in heaven and I saw this stuff. I don't want to. I don't want to. Anyway. Huh. We huh. should go see it. Hayden Christensen. You know, he was, he competed in the Eco Challenge. I don't know what that is. No, I don't either. The Ego Challenge was Mark Burnett's first big television foray. It was he was he organized this adventure race and they made it they televised it. And it was just it's this really grueling adventure race. It was was like, it before he was famous or was this it? This is pre Survivor. 
Well, no, but so Hayden Christensen, Christensen was not famous. After yeah. him, basically, after shooting this movie, I believe. Okay. Um, him and his like brother and sister formed a team, and this is like something where like professional adventure racers have to do it. Yeah. And this was right when the Eco Challenge sort of blew up, and so it was like for the first time ever, it was like Hayden Christensen and he his friends form a team, and then Playboy has their team, and <laughs> so then it was like. It would follow not only the pro adventure racers who are at the front, but also yeah. these people who are like struggling to survive this thing. Yeah. But it was so interesting seeing Hayden Christensen and his team ended up having to get eliminated. They got like rescued. But, but, they got rescued in the middle of it. Yeah. Was he mildly charismatic? Yeah, was he nice? Yeah, he, he seemed, seemed like nice. A cool he seemed like guy, right? a yeah. normal kid. But yeah. Yeah, the situation he was put in was really tough for this film. Oh yeah, it's impossible. No, yeah. For someone who has as little experience as he did, and you know, I think it's very limited as an actor, it, like. That performance is inexcusably bad, but there's also no way he was going to produce a good no, I believe, performance in those circumstances. I believe his performance is excusably bad. Really? I believe it is, because I believe this, the situation he was put in, is along with impossible? all the other performers, is a nearly impossible scenario. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's in the worst situation of any performer in this film, I think. Yes, I believe Because the film is so. on his shoulders more than anyone else. He's the greenest actor. He's the one who's new to the... He was in the first one. He's the only character in the film who is playing an emotional arc. Everyone else is the same at the beginning and the end. Obi-Wan is kind of like the gruff, you know, know, dad guy. And, you know, Padme is the same. He's the only one who has to change Mm -hmm. and, like, show real development. And, like, obviously the script gives him no no, uh, faculties there. And the problem becomes that... um, Here's the scene where Mace Windu and Yoda admit that like their Jedi powers don't work anymore. And oh, it's yeah. not addressed again. Can I point? There was a scene. Uh, there was not. It was in the concept art gallery on on fucking Coruscant on the fucking Blu-ray mm-hmm. on disc twenty-seven. But there was a uh, like an unused concept art thing of Mace Windu's office, and the caption underneath <laughs> was uh, George decided to scrap the scene that takes place in Mace Windu's office after he decided having him in in a real world office took you out of the reality of the film. And the concept part was literally just like Mace Windu sitting in like a Goldman Sachs like <laughs> corner of it. It was supposed to be like I guess this scene or one of the scenes like this where he brings in Anakin. Right. But it was like this room, and it was just like a corner office with a big desk and like some desk toys and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, like a drinking bird. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, a- Anakin, yeah. God, take a seat. Yeah. <laughs> <He just, laughs> His lightsabers like sitting in a credenza. <laughs> Elizabeth, can you buzz in, Anakin? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the worst part of Attack of the Clones. <laughs> at least in Phantom Menace, the Jedis, they're in this like weird tower and they yeah. sit at the top in their chair. This one, it's, yeah, it's like, oh yeah, welcome to like the, here's the school, here's the yeah. library. It's just, yeah. it's just yeah. a boring like community center. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, you can get the Jedi discount if you go to Moss Eisen from your <laughs> Jedi card. Uh, JD. Yes. Amato. Uh, our guest today on, mm-hmm. on this week's episode. Did we introduce him? No, I don't think so. Um, filmmaker. Give it to him uh, for Newman. Thank you. Oh, of yeah, course. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for being here. It's a pleasure. Um, y- you're a filmmaker. Yes. Uh, I'm an actor. Uh, I'm, more of a, I'm more of a wannabe filmmaker. I haven't made a film yet. I feel like I'm a wannabe. Actor, I haven't made a fi- feature film yet. You're a director. I've made a lot of TV. You're 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 a content creator. Yeah. Well, we're all content creators in this 21st and century that's economy. True. Um, made a lot of short films. It's done a lot of TV. Yeah, and wor- and worked in special effects back in college, and mm-hmm. s- did a lot in special effects, and now I mostly work in TV. Uh, show running. I think the point you made is uh, very uh, smart and logical and, and basic and obvious, but but powerful. That like uh, any other thing you do in a movie is kind of window dressing if the performances aren't uh, emotionally uh, accessible to the audience. Because that is really like the entry and the story. point for everybody. Yeah, yeah, but it's like the story gets funneled through the people, you know. Sure. And like you're going to be turned off more by a bad performance than by bad effects. If the story's working, you go, "That looks shitty," but it's awesome. Like there are Absolutely tons of great true. movies that have bad elements. And TV shows. But if like the performances work and the story works through those performances, you can kind of forgive a lot. You can. I mean, look at like King Kong. Yeah. Or whatever. Any anything that was made basically a hundred years ago. If right. The story's good. Now, don't you think the cornerstone of getting good performances out of actors is letting them work with each other and, like, find chemistry and energy with each other? Uh, yeah, I think that's an important aspect of it. Yeah. D- isn't it so counterintuitive to, like, throw someone like Hayden Christensen? They, go- they spent a lot of time talking about how um, the droid factory sequence sure. was uh, they, they shot the film. They went through post, 
They were like finishing effects and editing it. And then there was like, oh, there's this weird lag. There isn't enough action. They cut out a couple more dramatic scenes and they were like, let's add this droid factory thing, which was never in the yeah, script. We haven't sure. talked about this yet. That was added nine months into post production. Right. George Lucas was decided after seeing a concept drawing of the droid factory that there should be a whole extended sequence that took place here. So they shot the scene that took place before and after that. Yeah. Already. And just plopped in this scene, which we've talked about how. It is completely incongruous and bizarre. With everything else in the movie. And, and how, it's basically like a children's comedy routine. And how their performances are notably, like, maybe at their worst in that scene because you can't tell what they're reacting to. Like, right. the, the things, the cranes they're sweeping away from. And we thought it was just, oh, he was giving them vague direction. But not only was it, like, nine months later, they didn't have a script for them. They were like, we're going to work some stuff in. They showed them some rough, like, previous animation. They explained they shot all of that in fucking four and a half yeah, hours. Yeah, they said they shot it before lunch. Yeah. So, like, all the scenes of them, like, on conveyor belts and, like, you know, you know, like a falling year plus over later, fighting people. They fly them to fucking London a year after they finish the movie. reshoots at Pinewood or uh, Elstree. Yeah. And they're like, okay, so just pretend like there's a bowl. And you're like, what? And you're looking <laughs> over. And they're like, look over their shoulders to literally ask, wait, what are you saying? And they use that take. And they're like, great, moving on. <laughs> like they gave no one any time to fucking make this work. So if you're going to do a movie like this, and there have been other films done in this sort of virtual filmmaking way since then, 300 notably. Uh, Sky Captain in the World Tomorrow, Sin mm. City. Do you read that story about Sky Captain? Yeah, oh, it was boy. fascinating. It was fascinating. Uh, the big thing that links uh, Sin City and 300 and many of the other films that have been done in this style is that they are far more expressionist. Yeah, the actor. Oh, and sure. stylized. The, the, the visuals, yes, of course. But the performances kind of match that. Yes. And they almost sort of weaponize how weird the energy is in these movies once all these hermetically sealed elements just like taped together like a collage. And and those movies are trying to look like fucking illustrations and like paintings. And like, I know this is fucking Attack of the Clones, but it is trying to establish a reality within this fantasy world. It's trying mm -hmm. to take a fantasy world and film it as if it is a real world that exists. Whereas Sin City is like, these are people, these are cartoons. Sure. These are drawings come to life. Right. Um, but I think all of those films, with all their mis mixed levels of success and failure artistically, you can tell that the directors went out of their way to make it clear to the actors what they were doing, to provide clear context, guidelines, emotional like surroundings, sure. things to play off of, you know, right. explain to the depth. And you're working with a director here who's trying to push these boundaries and seemingly hates actors. Like, he I, seems very okay. dismissive of what actors do. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dial this back a little bit. Sure. To, I'll say this first, is that as someone who tries to make stuff professionally. I try mm -hmm. I try not to criticize other people's things too much. Yes. Um just because Griffin also uh should do that but doesn't. I should. I have sure. someone who wants to work in Hollywood and like, you know, form connections with uh, you know, people who make movies. He uh, is doing an abominable job of networking. My agents told me not to do this because yeah. so, I just badmouth people every week and yeah. I'm just not going to get hired ever again. And so one of the things that I try not to do is I I try not to endow characteristics onto directors or creators. Sure. Um when I criticize or look at the things that they create. You just because, look at the product. Well, Look at the product. I think. I think as if if you're going to criticize some, something, you have to look. How, how do R two and C three PO end up anyway? It doesn't matter. Carry it doesn't on. matter. You have to look at something as basically a primary source, right? Mm -hmm. This was created, and my first instinct is always you have to say this is how the person intended to make it. That has that should be your first instinct. I agree. Is yeah. this is how they intended Does to make it? Does that seem weird to you? Well, don't try to guess it. Why? That's what they intended. Exactly. That's what they intended. Don't like uh, one of my least favorite things in criticism is when someone goes. Um, this director is an idiot. They didn't even think of how to do da 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 because it's it's instead of looking at the film as a primary source, it's it's then cr it's crafting your own narrative for what the director is doing, which yes. then gets you down the road of you're just self justifying for whatever things you see in that. Which, mind that, you, there are tons of terrible movies made by very intelligent people with the best intentions, and there are a bunch of incredible movies that were mistakes where people ended up doing things wrong, and the final product. Right, yeah, they figured it brilliant out. Brilliant right. in a way that that it can only work when divorced from what their intentions exactly. Were. And so then I think the second part of things, if I look at something that feels really off or I really don't like it, and um, I have trouble believing that this was the intention of the creator, mm -hmm. then the next step is I look at the process. Yes, and try to see what happened in the process and the actual story of making this that could have led to this version of things. So in looking at this film, I think there's a lot to speak of because also let's keep in mind. Um, George Lucas, um, 
what what are what are the what are the what are the things that you guys know George Lucas? You know, from? he made he made American Graffiti. He made THX 1138. It took a long break. He might be one or two other movies, movies in the seventies. He produced, produced Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay, and great. Produced like back, Legend yeah. and great. is it Legend I'm, or Willow? I was Willow. Which Willow. Is Willow. Legend, Legend is Ridley Scott. Uh, Legend is Ridley Scott. Uh, Scott. Lost it's Ark. amazing, and I could do a whole podcast about Legend. Oh, that's it's interesting. Because sometimes. I sometimes see people go crazy for Willow. I sometimes I see love Willow. Go crazy for you know Legend. I was just reading about Tom Cruise and like how that was his like escape from Top Gun and from fame because yeah. yeah. that movie took a long time to make and yeah. he was like in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and, and he like, just like England, secluded yeah. himself. In that England, was before yeah. Top Gun, though. Well, I think it was no. Wait, was it? All right, I'm looking. I believe we, maybe it was after Risky Business. I think not, it was yeah. right after Risky yeah. Business. Yeah. Yes, no, not, not, not Legend. Think, Legend. He was I think 21 years old. It's crazy. And it was right Mira, after Risky Business. Mia Sarah was 16. Um, went to my Tim Curry school. is incredible. In Love Legend, and the original film they they made they set to make out in Legend is an incredible film, and what the studio did to it made it into a not a good film. Mm. We can get into all that stuff. The soundtrack, oh my god! You can mm. also listen to Twelve Hour Day. There's a lot of you explaining. Yes, you, you got to yeah. come back and do Legend sometime. Oh my god! You know, you know yeah. we're gonna do other, we they, these. That's the kind of movies we're interested in, where like a lot of creative capital is being put on the line. Yeah, you know, when someone sorts of has movies. sort of like free reign to make something. I mean, that's because that's what these movies are. And these what? are self financed. We should do a podcast called "We Are Legend," where we talk about legend. <laughs> that's but, a really good title. But then, can we also talk about "I Am Legend" because I think that movie's brilliant too. Yeah, I think that's except an interesting... it has a horrible ending. Wait, what? The the Francis Lawrence movie "I Am Legend." If you're seeing "I Am what Legend," what movie? "I Am Legend." What is that? You don't know that one? What is? I, I am legend. I'm legend. Yeah, yeah I've yeah. never heard of this. Wait, really? Yeah, with Will Smith. Will Smith. Yeah. I, can't I can't tell, tell if he's doing, doing a bit. bit right I can't now. tell because JD's kind of uh, sort See, of like we don't do bits on this show. That's the thing. We don't do bits on it. Yeah, this no, is this show is straight raw from criticism. the heart. No, I'm sorry, guys. I apologize. I was doing a bit where I acted like I didn't know a movie existed. Oh, I yeah, see. see. No, we wouldn't do that. that yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't get that. Yeah, sorry. We try to work with our full Good intelligence, movie, our full yeah. reference base. Remember yeah. the Shrek monologue in I Am Legend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he just recites the scene from Shrek. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, okay, JD, that's funny, um, but please don't do that anymore on our show. Yeah, it's sorry. weird, weird we don't to do those kinds of bits. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I won't do a bit. <laughs> I yeah. won't do a bit where I act like. And you know what I really hate is those kind of like meta bits where you're like doing a bit about another bit. That, Ugh, that's that drives insufferable. Me crazy. That's like insufferable. that's that's why people hate modern comedy. <laughs> yeah, Ugh. and like bits about bits about bits. It's Jesus just like the Christ. fucking levels. And the too worst thing like... is when white guys have some fucking podcast where they just like talk about movies all day. I know. You know what I'll say? I hate it when like white fifteen year olds. Think they can fix the racism of the world in a in a history paper? Yeah. That's like my least favorite thing in the Those world. Those people should actively be put. To Those death. people should be put like to the death. government should like send out agents hunting for them. Well, well, they should have been put to death at fifteen, but if they're still alive right now. And maybe let them go. No, no, I think I think yeah, yeah, you can you can you can't forgive. Maybe they're going to see their other ways. Fun fun fact: Whenever Griffin goes to the bathroom, he just mutters to himself that he solved racism. <laughs> <laughs> That um, is a weird reference. That's a weird, deep reference <laughs> to the jinx there. Um, uh, um, and then okay. he says, like, solved racism, of yeah. course. All the burping. Yeah. Anyway, go on. Anyways. So you, what I was you getting, look at the process. I, I look yeah. at the process. And the process of this is actually really interesting because this film it was one of the most ambitious films um, at its time and probably looking back for where it was in the history of yeah. special effects mm-hmm. for what they wanted to achieve. And what it innovated that is now... To us, completely commonplace. And so there's a couple concepts that are important to understanding a film like this and why things like special effects are tough and why this doesn't work. And so, like, the first one is, like, just talking about the technological side, we can get into all the nitty-gritty details of what they had at their disposal and what things we take for granted now that they didn't have back then Mm -hmm. that make it much easier to create full, real-life special effects. Right. But then there's a concept that is very, very, very important to special effects being enjoyed, and that's the concept of the uncanny valley, Mm -hmm. which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Of course. Which is... uh, The more photorealistic you try to make something, like, there's a certain point at which that breaks and things just look really, really strange. Exactly. It's the the closer you get to reality, the more more your brain is is, um, shocked by discernible differences from reality. It's almost like a self-preservation mechanism in our brains, right? That we don't want to trust something that looks like us but is not real. Yeah, and I actually believe it came from um, basically like our inherent desire to like not be around sick people and people that had problems and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like the reason why Cookie Monster doesn't bother us, but like a kid can watch Sesame Street and not be bothered by Cookie Monster. But if a kid meets someone who has like a chromosome disorder, they'll like burst into tears yeah. uncomfortably because it's like 
that looks like a person, right. but something's off close. and I don't yes. know what. Right. Right. Yeah. And so your brain just goes into this panic mode. Whereas You're, You obsess over what the, is wrong. You exactly. You try to figure out what's wrong and then you lose focus and engagement with – when we're talking about with regards to movies. Right. What often happens is you then step out of it and are trying to figure out, like, are the eyes weird? Is it that the fingers move sure. the wrong right. way? Right, right, right. And then you're not paying attention anymore. And so the Uncanny Valley and Special Effects is when things start looking close – farther from a cartoon and close to reality – your mind puts up more red flags as to this is not real because it goes, this looks very close to being real, but it's not. Um, and I need, to, I need to figure out why. Mm-hmm. And so special effects, that's your biggest, that's the thing you're battling the most is the uncanny valley. And not only does that go for character performances, like things like creatures, that's why I think a lot of the aliens and creatures in Star Wars aren't bothersome. But the moment they try to create humans in CG or um, organic elements in CG. You're... Even just things like creatures that have hair, it feels weird. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or like when you start seeing people's mouths or eyes or things like that. Mm-hmm. If you see a wide shot of a bunch of creatures walking across the screen, it looks fine because you have no context for that. But, but then the moment you see them turn Hayden Christensen into a CG puppet that's doing a backflip, your brain is like, what is, I don't, this is not real. It and Dexter so Jetser's mustache, I would argue, has a similar effect. Where I get really grossed out when I see it because we know right. what a mustache is supposed to look like, even if it's on a weird frog alien. Too. Right. And there's a couple concepts in. Um, that, I mean, he's kind of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's something. Yeah. He's something. He's. Uh, well, that's why we like Dexter is because he's not quite as recognizably an ethnic type. He's right. a melting pot. The mistake yeah. the first movies make where it's like, yeah, this is one ethnic type. Oh, that the we Viceroy recognize. is an Asian man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. We've yeah. talked about that extensively. Yeah, we've talked about <laughs> The Viceroy is a state. Yeah. He's worse than Rosemary's Baby in terms of Not that. Rosemary's Baby. You mean uh, Breakfast, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Tiffany's. Right, well, Breakfast is, and Rosemary's Baby at the end when... Is there an Asian person? Oh, there's yeah. a guy taking the photo. He goes, oh, he yeah, takes yeah, a yeah. photo and it's just like, <laughs> it's, it's oh, one moment, though. That? Yeah. Breakfast at Tiffany's Breakfast has, like, Tiffany's had intermissions <laughs> where yeah. they just let Mickey Rooney do, Look, like, a sidetrack from the Chinese food waiter. Yeah. One of my favorite movies of all time, The Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3, has, yeah. like, a whole extended comedy bit that goes through the movie where Walter Matthau's having to deal with a bunch of Japanese businessmen who are, like, yeah. touring the MTA subway office. And he, like, literally just insults them to their face because he, he thinks they don't understand English all mm-hmm. the time. And they're just all like, oh, yes, yes. you know, it's terrible. A Chinese yeah. food yeah. waiter is Buddy Hackett, not uh, Mickey Rooney. I just want to correct that. No, but no, in Breakfast in Tiffany's, Breakfast Tiffany's but Rooney. I connected it Mr. to Yoshi. a Buddy Hackett uh, comedy right. album. It's but fine. I, I remember I don't, even when I, I saw Breakfast Tiffany's when I was like eight years old, and my mother was like, oh, I forgot Mickey Rooney's in this movie. And I was like, this is deeply strange that this is in this film. I remember what my initial reaction was. I, I was a small child, and I watched it. I turned to my mom and went, is that illegal? Okay, that's it. <laughs> done. I've done my damage for it's the episode. Horrifying. That's my damage for the week. It's horrifying that you do. Oh, this is the lightsaber fight. Is that illegal? Ugh. All right. You so, did it. You did anyways, it already. with animation and Uncanny Valley, there's a, couple, there's a couple things that are very tough and are sort of like white whales in mm-hmm. computer-generated images and uh, 3D animation. Uh, one of those is weight. The concept of weight is so, so impossibly difficult to nail down, which is why performance capture became such a huge thing. Is because it allowed you to have, have weight built into things because you were capturing truly right, what right. weight was. Yeah. Whereas when you're dealing with just An like actual working, human body, or when you're working whatever. from scratch, weight never works how you want it to. So that's why in this you see a lot of characters that feel like they're sort of not quite yeah, it's, touching the ground. You're or absolutely sort of right about weight. It. That's something it's like a marionette that, effect. Yeah. It's like they're being right. pulled from above. Yeah. The next big element that is uh, a huge sort of like white whale in terms of the uncanny valley of 3D animation is um, there's there's this thing. I, there's a great – I forget who wrote about it. One of the Disney old men talks about it. But like um, when two – CGI. When two animated characters touch each other, it's sort of like a magical moment because it's two things that don't exist sure. having contact. And contact is something we take for granted because it's like my particles hit this this right. thing. But in animation, it's such a, a sort of a mind mind blowing concept of how to replicate this thing with two sort of two things that are just projections of what reality is supposed to be. So in three D animation, when a three D character touches another three D character, it's impossibly difficult. Uh, because logically the two figures should just pass through each other like ghosts. Right, because it's all yeah. just data. and so Or melt into one blob. Right, Like exactly. in the lawnmower man. And then even more difficult than that is when... Nice work, Dave. Well done. No way. Okay, Dave. Is when a animated character... The community character, episode that spoofed it was the funniest fucking thing of the year. Of yeah. Lawnmower Man? Ugh, it's such, such a funny episode. I didn't see that. It's really, really funny. 
You should watch it. Do they have a horrible CG? Yeah. yeah Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Keith David. Uh, Keith Ron David Ron. Is, plays a man who designed a VR like computer system that is obviously completely defunct. His and name's uh, Elroy Patash. It's, 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 it's amazing. Brilliant. And it's brilliant. Lawn, Lawnmower Man, while we're speaking of it, first feature of a first CG, CG. Yeah. live action integrated character. Yeah. And so when an animated character touches a real element, that is also a very, very difficult. Sure, having them like mm-hmm. pick something up or... Yeah, or yeah. having them maybe, say, hug each other in a diner. Yeah. It's extremely <laughs> Great impossible. Example. I mean, yeah, yeah. And that's why it's sometimes even easier then to just scrap everything and go, We're, well, let's just make them all CG. That, that way we have control over it. And then the last thing is anything that's... And then there's things like this that are just completely realistic and just completely work and don't seem weird at all. The Yoda fight, yeah. yeah <laughs> it's just, yeah, yeah, anyway, go on. And then... Um, Anything organic is the last time. So that includes lighting. That includes um, facial recognition. Th- all, the, all these little things that we take for granted are incredibly hard to do. And so there's a couple concepts that have gone into that that they didn't have at their disposal. So the first big one that they didn't have in shooting the Attack of the Clones was motion capture mm-hmm. right. and performance capture. Right. That is huge. Come on, guess. That's huge. They don't have it for like Yoda or Jar Jar, any of the characters. 90% have like a of the A lot cast. of dialogue. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And what that meant is that it was much easier for them to create CG everything and then add in the real elements sparsely than it was to have real elements and add in these CG elements to mix because then the CG elements would pop out of the screen. Whereas when everything's CG, it makes it easier for you to sort of manipulate stuff. But that meant that you ended up in these scenarios where these actors then were put in these uh, giant blue expanses. Right, right. and, and mm-hmm. are hitting off of nothing the whole time. They're given nothing, yeah. all in pursuit of avoiding having that situation where they can't adjust or tweak right. based on reality. And that's right. a lot of that has to do with the technology that they had. And also, watching this Blu-ray today, I think um, the, the digital elements look so much crisper than the human elements. Yes. Which I know is just camera limitations at the time, but there's this weird disparity between, like, when there's a fully digital shot in the movie, when they're, like, establishing shots of a location, right. you see ships flying by, you see creatures on the ground or whatever, it kind of looks beautiful every time. The second you throw an actor in there, it always feels weirdly muddled. Yeah. It's yeah. like you're looking through, a, like, paint of dirty glass. Well, what that gets into is basically this was the first film they shot entirely on HD camera, mm-hmm. and the camera they're using shot in 1920 by 1080, which is... Like now, what we consider HD, but when we shoot special effects stuff now, we shoot in much higher resolution than HD because that gives us the ability to move and change things around. Mm-hmm. They didn't have that. On top of that, their camera sensors for what they're using were much le- had much less less information on them, which meant that basically, like um, when you basically everyone knows that when you record information, it's pixels, right? And pixels, what it boils down to is um, if you draw a square on a piece of paper. And then draw two lines that so you have basically like three horizontal bars next to each other and make one red, one green, one blue. Um, that's what a pixel is. It's red, green, and blue. And then the color of the pixel is determined by how much red, how much green, how much blue is there. And that's that's all of what pixel. There's also a, a fourth category, which is uh, transparency or like white value, um, which basically that means how much you can see through a pixel. So that's. That's, that's the, the building block of everything. That's the building we see block of everything. And yeah. and these pixels were overdosing on blue because they were photographing ninety eight percent blue. Right. So basically, um, if you think about those these pixels, right? Um, let's say that like one means that like all the way red, zero means no red. And if you think of like a TV screen or something like that, if like if if red, green, and blue are completely one hundred percent, that means it's white, just because you're getting all of the color information that you need. Sure. And if it's ultimate zero, that's black. Now, the amount of gradients between that, that's what color depth is. So the amount that you can specify how much, how much color there is, that's what color depth gets into. And basically, for these cameras, they didn't have that much color depth. And they also have what's called digital noise, which basically means in recording all of this stuff, um, they're sort of, um, you can just think of it as like um, data is in taken in sort of incorrectly or with with less precision so that creates sort of like this like staticky noise and that staticky noise interrupts the color depth and the amount of information you have about the color so that means that if you try to adjust it it starts looking not real which is why cameras now have this like they have such high color depth and have such pixel density you're shooting in 4k that basically you can do anything you want with the image it will still look how it looks with these cameras they could do very little with it they had very little in film, you call it dynamic range, 
Um, film has incredible... 35 millimeter has incredible dynamic na- range. 70 millimeter has ridiculous dynamic range. You could probably... You could take, like, an IMAX 70 millimeter film and you could, like, shoot it at the sun and also have, like, a nighttime scene in front of it and they would both expose properly because there's so much um, range in the film. Early HD cameras had absolutely, like, minimum, minimum, minimum color depth and color range and dynamic range. Like, literally, it was impossibly difficult to get things exposed correctly. Why did they shoot the movie on this, then? Because, otherwise, if you shoot on film... Basically, this was the very early, early yeah, no, days I know, I know, I know. of, of um, CG, which meant that the computer processors they had were not that advanced. Right. So the process it of It is get, crazy in the documentary, you see them working on what looked like a 90s big blocky computer. Yeah, yeah. their CRT screens yeah, God, and all this it's stuff. So like, hard it's to truly imagine crazy. Imagine them making all of this on those. And so what that meant was that um, to get these, fi- basically you need all these elements that you shoot to end up digitally because you're going to be mm-hmm. manipulating them digitally. So it would be adding another step onto the process. I get it. No, so I, what yeah, you create yeah, otherwise yeah. is what's called a digital intermediate where you shoot on film and then you scan that film to digital. At the right. time that we that this Which was they made, did for Phantom Menace. Exactly. In yeah. the time that this was made, the digital intermediate process was actually really cumbersome mm-hmm. and it meant that the workflow was much longer. Whereas this way, they could just shoot stuff and immediately bring it into computers and start working with it which is a huge advantage workflow-wise to what they're doing, but not a huge advantage color-wise to what they're doing. And um, You know, with everything you're saying now, I think the movie looks great because, like, you're, the way you're talking, it feels like this movie should just look like washed-out garbage, and it looks okay. Right, and that's, that's yeah. sort of what I'm saying. It's like right. they were up against yeah, a they lot, were doing a lot, a, yeah. a lot, and, and they did a really good job. From the documentaries, it really does seem like they were working 24 hours a day. Well, they said when they added that, that uh, the, 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 the droid, droid factory scene, everyone had to work, like, 25 hours a day yeah. for, like, you know, 17 months. And 40 billion years. But this is the thing. It took them three years to make this movie. I know. Max. I know. Right? Between 99 and 2002. Yeah. That's what. Yeah. That's their window. Yeah. Um, I don't even know when they shot it. I, I have no I idea. I think they started uh, principal photography in 2000 yeah, is what sense. I read. Right. And the other thing to consider is that when they did this, they didn't have at their disposal a few things that are huge now. One of the big things is that was just starting. They did a little bit of it, I believe, in this film, but not so much. When you talk about special effects, there's this guy that basically created all of modern special effects for 3D live ad- action integration with digital elements. And that's this guy, Paul Depovec. And he's won all these SIGGRAPH awards and all these Academy Awards, all this stuff, because he is a genius. And so pretty much every technology you see is this guy sort of created, this sort of genius sort of helped create it with his team of people. And um, one of those big things is what's called HDR illumination. And that's global illumination, which means that when you shoot something in real life, and you have you interact with the digital element, you have to have the digital lighting that is theoretical in the computer right. match mm-hmm. the live action lighting. Right. That's a nearly impossible the process. The sun needs yes. to hit Jar Jar in the same way that it's hitting Hayden Christensen. Exactly. Or whatever. Yeah. And that's what was one of the things that made early CG so impossible to integrate with live action. Right. And why for something like this, it's easier for them to shoot um, basically like you can shoot a full scene and put a CG element in, or you can shoot a live action element put it in a CG world. Those both have their, their no, I know. Like, that's your minuses. whole argument is that yeah. is kind of like that's why they're mostly relying on a CG world. All of this, and yeah. so they didn't have HDRI illumination stuff. They had a little bit of it. And basically, what that is is you can take you you take a a mirror ball and you shoot a camera at it, and you take all the ranges of exposure of that mirror ball, and then if you take that image of that mirror, it's actually you're shooting every because of the way a sphere works, all of the mirror is projecting out the entire scene around you. Like, imagine if you're looking at a sphere. You can even do this if you look at just, like, a glass ball or something you have like that. Like, you see it reflect everything in the room. That way, what you do is you have all the information, and then in a computer, you basically use math to inversely project that image onto a sphere around your digital scene, and then you shoot theoretical light rays through that sphere. And based on how bright or dark things are in the HDRI image... It picks up light and then puts that on your element. If you don't have that, otherwise your best bet is you just have to pick. I think this is sort of what the lighting scenario was. Right. I guess we'll just put this light here, which is what why I believe a lot of the lighting in this film is really whack. Is really just like this bizarre atmospheric studio lighting, and their skin tones really off throughout. We've right. talked about this a lot. Like especially the, in the, the humans scenes. look really odd. Yeah. And there's there's really no good source lighting in this. If you look at all this sort of like very atmospheric soft lighting, which makes the humans look weird, but makes it easier to render and match lighting for the CG elements. But it creates, again, another step of the uncanny valley. 
how come this looks weird? It's because, oh, because that light that's lighting this person in this room that's supposed to be 10 feet high, that light is actually 30 feet high in the studio. And though you don't notice it objectively, your eye picks it up and you go, oh, something's wrong here. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. And there were just so many elements of Uncanny Valley in this film that it makes the whole thing seem odd. Right. And the big one being the performances are also bizarre. So then all these visual cues set you off and the performances are bizarre. So then you're just lost and you go, I don't know what this is like or why this is. the most off-putting movie ever made. Exactly. You've, you've explained on a technical level why this movie makes people feel weird. Right. Well, which is, yeah. yeah. They also didn't have subsurface scattering, which is basically you have oil on your skin. So when you light something in CG... Um, you, you sort of create materials that's the reflectiveness of skin, but skin actually isn't reflective like cloth or metal is. Mm-hmm. There's oil on your skin. So what happens when light goes into your skin, it actually goes through oil and then bounces off material and then scatters. Mm-hmm. And so this guy, Paul Deb- Debevec, created this whole system to sort of capture real-life people's skin, which is why in this, whenever you see it go to a CG model of a person, it looks so weird and shiny. That's because they didn't actually develop this process yet to create this sort of um, oily subsurface scattering that mm-hmm. hadn't been invented yet. So all this stuff they were just doing by eye, and all the animation they're doing by eye, and it was the best of the best of the best doing that. But man, is it impossible? And they got so so close. Yeah. But the problem is they got so so close. So it creates it looks all those even weirder. It right. creates all those uncanny fat. It can't look flags. stylized. Exactly. There's um, a thing on one of the making of things where. Uh, George is like sitting with the team and maybe he's talking to camera at this point. He like looks over and talks straight to the documentary or uh, he's with the uh, what's his name? Rick McCollum, the producer. Yeah, yeah. And he's saying like this is so stressful and this is so overwhelming. So, I mean, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but he's like not only is it that, you know, no one's tried to do this on this scale before and has tried to do most of the separate elements of what we're, we're trying to do on this movie, let alone put all those elements together into one project. And so there's a responsibility and the pressure of, are we going to make this movie good? But I'm also, like, breaking the barriers for all this technology to allow other people to use it in the future, so we really have to figure it out the right way. And you feel like that was the cart. Like the horse, the cart leading the horse on this entire movie. Yeah. Is that like everything came from, okay, here's like my rough idea of the movie. What if I want to do it in this technical way and revolutionize how films are made? Well, now I have to distort everything in my plan for what this film is on a narrative and emotional level to fit into this workflow, which is unprecedented. He kind of succeeded, as you pointed out. I mean, not he wasn't the one who revolutionized everything, but the fact that he pushed filmmaking into this next phase caused other people to have to step up and figure out how to make it less weird and creepy. And now these things are able to be done far more seamlessly. Usually not wall-to-wall the same extent that fucking Georgie Porgy's doing because most people realize it's good to have fucking actors responding to things. Right. But there's so many sequences in big movies where everything's done in computer and you it doesn't even really fucking register. You can tell, but it works and it's seamless enough. Right. But this is just a fucking disaster. And so with all of that, I ask you, J.D., is this a good sequel? <laughs> no. I agree. Yeah, it's not Unequivocally, good. it is not a good sequel. It doesn't sequelize well. It just doesn't make sense. I don't understand it. I don't... Being someone who's looked into looked into all of the outer universe elements of this series... Sure, you've, like, you've really tried to invest in the whole world. Yeah. Doesn't make sense. No, I cannot yeah. follow it. No, no, no. What's and with I, the clones? Where did they come from? And I will say, George tried his best. Yeah. But he put himself in a situation where he he created a workflow where no one could help him, no one could save him. There were no actors. The no, actors, you're right. the, the actors were not put in a situation where they could help him, they could add charm, or they could figure out their character. No one could have done right. Yeah. None of the teams working on pre visualization or creating any of the characters, none of them could help him because no one was able to see the big picture except for him because of this workflow and because of that he was left. Everyone independently was left out the dry, and as a result, he was left out. No one could help each other. And so the film just was this sort of like mindless thing that took over its own control and just got to the finish line just because the workflow. And because it had to. As had well. to. Yeah. Because it had to. You mean sort of like how Chancellor Palpatine, given complete power, chooses to militarize, which it feels like may lead to the downfall of the Republic? There is a theory out there that has always been stated that I believe truly is that, um, granted, consider like the auteur theory of filmmaking where the Mm -hmm. director is the one whose vision is everything. If that is the case, then there is a belief that 
every film is truly about the director. I agree. And I, I, that is something that I always find very interesting. And whenever I watch a film, I always think about that. And I would say this, this film is no different. It's about power corrupting people. Yes. It's about someone having the world at the fingertips and convincing themselves that they're making the right decision for everyone else in the future. And everyone else being unable to see the big picture of what they're trying to achieve and going along with the flow. And then disaster happens. That is true, especially when you get to the Jedi, where it's like, if they zoomed out for a second, they should probably realize like there's something nefarious like at the heart of Denmark, you know, like right, right, right under their nose. But they keep being like, okay, well, someone tried to kill Amidala. Let's figure that out. Like, you know, it's sort of one thing at a time. All right. Yeah. You know, where, whereas they should really just be asking the bigger questions. And now there's a fucking clone war that everyone has to fight off screen. How do you know it's off screen? Also, why did it's not in the movie? This is the last movie they made. Yeah, why? Sad. Django Fett name his son Boba. Oh, I don't even. We don't. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Boba. JD, Boba. thank you so much for being on the show. Did we introduce you yet? Uh, yeah, I think something close to JD, it. JD, did you see Fantastic Four? No. Yeah, it's really weird. Have you seen it yet? No, I need to see it. How have you guys not seen it? I'm so scared. I really to want watch to talk it. to you guys. I about sort of it. feel the same way JD feels. The reason he hasn't watched. Oh, it's Tiger like Clones in a but. No, but like it is bad. Fantastic Four Fantastic is my favorite. Me too. Yeah, we They're, all love yeah. Fantastic. Four. They have not made a good Fantastic Four film. No. Uh, what do you guys think is the best Fantastic Four film made? You can't say The Incredibles. Corman. Yeah, agreed. No, it's it's the second Tim Story movie. Not true. No, Corman. Corman, one hundred percent. Because this is the thing. Corman, I, I wrote. The, I write. I wrote an article. Ole about, Sassoon wasn't I, that his name? It was Vidal Sassoon's son directed yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. I wrote a whole article about like why Fantastic Four has been so troublesome to adapt over these yeah. years, and I like then I was like, you know, the Corman film is so kitschy that it actually maybe almost is like almost right on tone. I, I rewatched the Corman film. No. It's not a good movie, but it gets the tone closer. No, no, no. For, Perhaps uh, Rise by of the accident, Silver Surfer gets the tone closer. Disagree. Uh, I didn't see any of the Fantastic Four movies except for the Corman one. Yeah, it's and I'm not saying one. that you've the done Rise, the, you've done the Rise, Rise of the Silver Surfer is abominable, but yeah. it still gets the tone better than the Corman uh, one. Corman movie has a good score and the right aesthetic Does executed have a decent poorly. Score. It's got a really good score. score. I downloaded it online. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's human torch effects are some of the best in the business. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're really crazy. I mean, I think the whole movie's special effects budget was clip art, right? Like, the whole movie is yeah. a, a clip art uh, yeah. special effects, yeah. Uh, it's like you hold a blowtorch in front of the camera and be like, stand behind that. <laughs> Producer Ben, a.k.a. Ben Deucer, a.k.a. Producer Ben, one, a.k.a. Hello Fennel, <laughs> a.k.a. The Haas, a.k.a. Mr. Positive. Yeah, what's up? Uh, what, what do you think? We, we get, how are you feeling about Attack of the Clowns? Uh, well, I mean, I'm so sick of this movie. We didn't touch upon the sound design, which I thought was great. <laughs> Wonderful. And Ben, ben Burt's very nice. I just wanted to put that out there. There were a couple sync issues. There were moments where they, yeah. they ADR'd in lines that yeah. you could see their yeah. mouth moving differently. Yeah. It's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard, hard, a lot of deadlines. This, is, this, this isn't the 60s and 70s anymore. You can't just have a wide shot and put any dialogue you want. They still We're do that in movies all the time. Are you crazy? In, have you guys seen Fantastic Four? The whole movie is ADR. We just told Clearly. you we haven't seen it, David. <laughs> we just told you we haven't seen We're it. We're in like, HD. I can literally, see, I can see Senator Amidala's lips moving differently than what she's saying, explaining why they know each other. Ben Burt still seems cool, though. J.D. Amato, thank you so much for being on the show. How uh, you doing, ben? And also, uh, since we're coming to uh, the end of a yeah. run here talking yeah. about Attack of the Clones, uh, I think we should uh, start uh, putting out the email address and see if any of the fans want to— Suggestions what you want us to cover. Yeah, or even just like— want to uh, talk about this movie. Final thoughts yeah. as well on, on the film in general. It's uh, Griffin and Simsburg? No, no, it's, no, it's Griffin and David present at Gmail. Oh, and the username, you typed in Griffin Simsburg yeah, as it, our name if we, in the Google If account. we sent yes. you an email from this, it would, it would say, say it was Griffel, from Griffin Simsburg. Simsburg. That's true. That was Ben's pitch for what we should call this podcast. Yeah, I was totally on board. Uh, Griffin rejected it. Uh, J.D. Mata, thank you so much for being on the show. J.D., what do you think we should call this podcast? Jedi Pudu. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It works, no. I mean, for any project. It's, it's, <laughs> Wait, it, what, 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 are you, what are you trying to figure out the name of? Well, we're called Griffin and David Present. That's sort of our, you know. But this right. is the last Subtitle. Star Wars movie. We're right. only doing 10 episodes. we got two more left. Like We're going to do other movies. You should soon. do other sci-fi movies. See what's out there. Yeah. My, my brother suggested Blank Check. Oh, uh, I love that movie. Or at least I did when I Not saw that we cinemas. covered, that we call the podcast like Blank Check or something. Oh. Some variation of Blank Check. Can we do a Blank Check episode? No, no question. Yeah, yeah. But the idea we of already like, did it. We people did it. giving complete creative control. Have you guys watched the doc on the making of The Island of Dr. Moreau? No. No, I, I've heard amazing the things The Kilmer, about Brando. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to watch that. Okay. Speaking of things How you got to watch, all 
10 episodes are now on YouTube for the Is Christmas that right? Yes. Uh, on or Friday, the 10th episode the tenth will drop episode. on YouTube. So this YouTube. won't uh, the tenth drop episode. till next week. Yeah. Oh, great. So yes, yeah. all 10 episodes are on The 10th episode was tremendous. Um, Thank you. Really it's, tremendous. It's an incredible, Thank beautiful you. season of television that you've produced. Yep. Thank you. Uh, hopefully it's there will be more. the kind of TV that actually challenges the boundaries of what the format can do, unlike everything else. Yep. And I would argue that supposedly uh, does that reminds us why TV exists in the first place. It's I agree. To be a method of communication to unite people around our country. Thank I you. agree again. That means a lot. Thank you. Uh, yeah. It's an incredible series. Everyone, please watch it. Uh, hopefully, there will be more. Uh, Cop show season one. Yep. Also That's on YouTube. On YouTube. All on YouTube or on lstudios.com. And uh, Terry Weathers mysteries you do monthly at UCB. I think it's the third Friday of every month. And it's a great show. People should Thank check you. it. That is really cool. And twelve hour a day. And twelve hour a day. Twelve hour a day. It's sporadic. Sort of is a podcast, you know, once yeah. in a while, right? Yeah, we're recording a new episode this week. Wait, really? What, what, what day? Uh, on Friday. Connor and I are both taking a plane to Colorado together. Oh, I knew about that. And for those of you who don't That's know, crazy. 12 Hour a Day is a podcast with JD and a past and future guest, Connor Ratliff, in which they just talk for 12 hours. Every yep. episode's 12 hours long in real time. At least 12 hours long. Yes, at least 12 yeah, hours Most of them have tipped over. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Uh, ben, thank you so much for tolerating this movie for another week. We're almost done. So close, so close. And as always, is that illegal? Third time's the charm, bro!